Welcome to Web Chat Wednesdays. My name is Chris, and I'm here with Ryan. How are you doing? Hello. Ryan? And in this episode, we are talking to Sri and Josh. Hello. Uh, yeah. Sri Kant Gudikanda is a physicist turned engineer and an artist based in San Francisco. He pursues his particular interest in art and idealism by harnessing technology and pop culture to achieve new imaginative goals in sculpture design. Sri is a co-founder and the current CFO of Looking Up Arts Foundation. And Josh Zubkoff is a San Francisco-based artist whose versatile work explores the intersection of pop culture and profound meaning. He is the creative director and a founding member of Looking Up Arts Foundation, a San Francisco-based nonprofit organization established in 2018 dedicated to building large-scale art installations while fostering a community around it. He is currently pursuing his MFA at CSULB. Thanks so much Welcome. for joining us. How are you guys doing today? Good, thank thanks you. for having us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, thanks for down. I'm, I'm really stoked. Your, your art's really, both of your art is really amazing. And it's like, I personally have an interest in stage like stage design and like installation design um so i'm really excited to talk about all this um but yeah to start off what is looking up arts foundation we are a community of artists designers engineers hackers painters pixel pokers all in all just doers that come together for the love of making public art that's awesome. I love that. So many and, people collaborating together. Yeah. I think um, on, on Rainbow Bridge, we had what, over 100 volunteers? Yeah. Wow. Pretty amazing. That's huge. Um, so it had um, over 25,000 um, pixels, and they were all hand poked. So when I, when I meant, wow. when I said uh, pixel pokers, it's for real. <laughs> literal pixel pokers <laughs> yeah we were poking pixel through cnc wood panels oh wow that's awesome there's like this like star wars documentary um where they show how they used to make like the the ships and they would they would do that with with the model ships and there was like so many little lights that we'd have to insert um so why did you two start look up arts foundation what was the calling for that um so in 2017, I received a Black Rock City honoraria to build Phenicopterus Rex, which was my the 40 foot tall lawn flamingo climbable. And it was just this huge undertaking. And I didn't know how to build something like that. And so the whole learning process, we built this amazing team and got all these resources together and got a, this unbelievable build space. And so when we finished the project, we're like, okay, we need to keep this going somehow. We need to figure out how to roll this into the next year. That's and awesome. Yeah, that was it. So Black Rock City, that's related to uh, Burning Man, right? Oh yeah. Yes. And they, they, did they see like your previous works or something or they? Um, I, so they do an honoraria almost every year. Um, and I had submitted, a bunch of proposals. They let anybody propose. And I submitted a terrible Photoshop of a 40 foot tall, like overscaled lawn flamingo. And they said yes. And that was that was the motivation to kind of quit my job and start making art full time. Wow, but, that's a huge life change. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so do you have like a certain goal behind each of the projects you two pursue? Or um, is it changing each time? It, it does definitely change from project to project, but if there is one or two common goals in my mind that all of our projects have, it's uh, community driven and uh, interactivity. Um, we love to make our project open for community to come in and participate and make it their own. And yeah, we love when our community comes together, creates with us and um, yeah, spend um, time with us. As far as interactivity, uh, 
Josh and I love climbable, touchable art. Uh, I guess that is a throwback to Burning Man. And we love to do that not only for Burning Man, but outside. And once you're at it, um, you have this great opportunity to introduce technology. And that tends to be also a common um, goal to achieve uh, interactivity via technology. That's awesome. Yeah, I did notice we were talking about how a lot of installations involve climbing. So much, it's so much fun. And it's also, it's such a different approach to art making where instead of like a, a rigid set of rules where this is how you behave here, it's totally wide open. And so if you don't, you know, design the work to be interacted with, I guess, in that open manner and that, I don't want to say uncontrolled, but like where people kind of have to find their way around it. Uh, if you don't design for it, they'll find the wrong way to use it. Yeah. <laughs> like they'll, they'll climb on things that are not meant for climbing, so. Well, th yeah, that, that that makes sense, especially like if you're having a Burning Man, it's a, a giant adult playground. People are having double vision, triple vision or kaleidoscope vision. They're trying to climb things and stuff. So it's good that you design it for that reason. And I think the, the rainbow, it was our second time working with a, a structural engineer. And so it is strong enough to hold, I think 300 people on top before it even wow. starts to flex. So more people than can possibly fit on it, but. That's amazing how strong it is. And yeah, can handle was... uh, wind speeds up to hundred miles per hour. Wow. I mean, I guess it has to when you're out in the desert like that. I mean, it has to be ready for any kind of weather, right? Yep, it has to be ready for art cars to drive into it. <laughs> <laughs> people to be jumping on it, people using flamethrowers on it. Whoa, man. Yeah. How, how long does it take to, to, I'm guessing you designed it to be like easily taken apart, but how long does it take to put together? And how many people does it, did the rainbow installation take? Like um, yeah. Right. Uh, we have installed it f um, five times so far, and our average build time is about six days, um, five to six days. Uh, we usually call the six day our buffer day to make sure ev everything's done. And if anything's missed during the build, that's taken care of on that day. As far as team size, um, on most days, it would be six people actively working. On some days, it goes up to 10. Wow, it's a lot of organization. But it's cool, you're making like it's a playground for all these people to enjoy. Yeah, when, I mean, when we first designed it, we were definitely thinking about, you know, getting it done that first time. And I don't think we ever imagined like, getting to evolve it and grow it and changing the process. But every time we build it, it's a little bit different, a little easier. <laughs> True. <laughs> That's good. Glad to hear it's getting easier. But yeah, I'm, I'm interested like both with the projects that you work with and then also your collaboration with each other. How has that grown over the years or changed over the years? You want to start with Bal? <laughs> <laughs> uh... <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> so we actually used to work together at a law firm seven years ago. Oh, wow. Um, so you have to like imagine us in a professional button down environment. Uh, I, honestly, though, it still feels the same most of the time. Like um, we would have some big problem that one of our teammates or clients would come to us with, and we'd always egg each other on to solve what would seem like an unsolvable problem and do it, you know, do it fast. <laughs> Yeah, we were uh, notorious in our company uh, for solving things quickly, effectively. Um, but on the management side, we were also known for <laughs> not really documenting these <laughs> quick solutions well. <laughs> we would rather, <laughs> our philosophy is like, why waste time on documenting while you can just keep solving? <laughs> we would just like say yes to uh, most of the issues that come our way. And um, yeah, we spend all our time there. Um, but since then, we've been, we played so many different roles with each, like 
with each other towards each other it's amazing um what uh creating art has uh did to us to our bonding or to our relationship i mean um there were times where one of us would be driving a heavy machinery uh, and the other person is uh like directing as a rigger there are times where um like we're getting each other uh, breakfast and coffee to the bed because the other person had to stay up like almost all night and only <laughs> had a few hours of sleep. Um, also, Josh uh, is my unofficial uh, art mentor. I only started making art uh, since 2018. So uh, that has been very uh, helpful to me, having not only a business partner, but also someone who uh, guides my um artistic journey yeah, yeah and, uh, I say good. like Sri has this amazing way of just believing things are possible and when like like when you're starting on a big project and there's no clear roadmap to it it's easy to get bogged down and they like you know, not knowing how to do it. And just because you don't know the solution, it's sometimes pretty daunting. And then you have someone like him who is like, always believes that it's possible. Um, and it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's nice. That's I awesome. love that philosophy. It's like, when you, when you like, tell yourself that nothing is impossible and that you can do anything, you really end up accomplishing amazing things that way. Yeah, well, Sri, you were you studied physics and then you became an engineer, right? Yes. So you kind of knows, you know, the boundaries of reality. So I yes, guess that, that makes that a little sense. Help. Like I, I know, I know we could do this because it, it's physically possible. <laughs> but you wait, you said you're also both of you were, worked at a law firm too. Yeah, uh, I was an engineer there. <laughs> oh, okay. An engineer um, at a law firm. Uh, 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 yeah, on the software side. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I was a database engineer um, using SQL Server. Did and you ever imagine you would go from that to what you're doing now? <laughs> um, I've known that I want to spend time making art. Um, growing up, I just didn't know how much of an active role that'll take, uh, career-wise or day-to-day -day wise, and. Um, it was an easy choice during my academic years to follow my intellectual pursuits. And that kind of uh, turned me into an engineer when that intellectual pursuits um, meets like the reality of like financial sustainability. And, um, but I kept searching for more and um, beautifully when my search was happening, I was introduced to Burning Man and Josh and our crew and slowly that just like like melded together and um, what I the drive to want to make art as a hobby uh, became like why not that why can't that be the thing that I want to pursue yeah yeah cool. so it started as a personal experiment like yeah let's see um, let's see what happens if I do this in an active role. And uh, since then, I haven't looked back. That's awesome. Um, did you two go to Burning Man before you had your first installations there? Yes. Um, Josh invited me to my first burn in 2015 while we were both still working uh, at the law firm. And Josh, that was before you uh, did the giant uh, flamingo? Yeah, um, let's see. My first year was 2014. And then I had made a small project in 2016 that Sri actually helped me out with. But that was like a two week build, very casual, didn't take over our lives. <laughs> no, nobody got hurt. We didn't break anything. And then <laughs> after that, like I, you know, I did undergrad for art. I've always loved art and life gets in the way. And then somehow going to Burning Man, I would say really kind of reignited that passion for art. And just the fact that I went from building a small like two week project to applying for this little grant, getting the grant, it was this huge inspiration to just start going. And our friend Cody, who's also a co-founder at Looking Up, 
he kind of egged us on really hard. He's like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. If you're making this giant flamingo, you should make it, you know, everything. Cause we're like, let's just make it big. Let's make it, you know, uh, affordable out of paper mache or something like, you know, something that we can actually build. He's like, no, no, go, go crazy, go big, make it, make it so big and so strong that 20 people can stand on it and, you know, massive steel frame and some somehow with his encouragement we got completely out of control. That's as awesome. a result, we created the biggest flamingo that has four legs. Yeah. No way. Ever. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Is it in the Guinness Book of World Records? It, it turns out it's a commercial uh, enterprise. You have to pay them to be on the record. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm sure there's some Guinness, uh, Guinness people at Burning Man that are that are burners. Um, but yeah, was was there a specific music or art event that inspired you to start creating installations? I know you already said like uh, Burning Man, but maybe when you were younger, like for instance, when I was like 15, I had the opportunity to go to Coachella, and I don't know that that just blew my mind because I never went to anything like that, especially at that age, and like seeing like these giant installations and just the performances i don't know like i've that kind of like made me just always be fascinated with interactive art and performance in general so do you have any maybe younger experiences like before burning man that that may have inspired you um, i would say the, the younger experiences were more on the like i don't know i don't want to say uninspiring side but it always seems so daunting. Like, you know, you see these amazing installations at like MoMA and you're, you don't know, you know, there's these, there are these mind blowing things where you're like, how am I ever gonna be able to do something that huge, like that audacious, you know, um, and get, you know, invited to do it. It's the, the whole, you know, how do you make it? And then how do you get it shown is so hard to grasp. And then I'd say Burning Man changed the philosophy for, for me because if you can somehow do it, that's all that matters. And between the two of us, we have such a strange skill set that I think we could do just about anything. Yeah, I mean, you guys kind of nice the like, legal side and the building side. <laughs> yeah, like if you can build it, and get it there and assemble it. That's all that matters. You don't have to really get permission. It's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. I think something interesting that you mentioned in your inspiration that I see in your projects too is this idea of accessibility because Burning Man gave you the opportunity to like create this when you had seen all those other artworks. And I mean, the, the idea of like getting shown places in the art world is like, like a whole other beast and being able to do that through Burning Man seems amazing. And then your, your projects are accessible in the way that people are able to interact with them, like both physically and also like metaphorically too even, like you're able mm -hmm. to change the rainbow with different lights um, and like, different images as well to engage with like the specific event that it is which I think is so cool so I almost I kind of see that like in your projects yeah I mean I think that the the inspiration between like doing the the nonprofit stuff was that we felt really lucky that we were able to put together a team and you know all of the resources in order to like make these huge projects and get it done and get it delivered. And if, at least for me, like the moment that clicked when we decided to do it was like, what if other people had access to these resources? Like what if, you know, obviously like, I, like we're good at just getting it done. And if we, uh, other artists come in and we just encourage them and push them and, you know, share the knowledge on how to put things on trucks. Like, you know, how to build it in a way that is both, you know, good structurally, but also for getting it done and getting it delivered. And so, yeah, I, I would say like, we really want to share that because we, we just like art getting made. Mm -hmm. 
yeah that, that that's that's an awesome philosophy you're just like fractaling out just like making it you know giving all that knowledge to a bunch of other artists and I think it's cool you're passing on to kind of what you got the opportunity to have that fire under you you know to make that installation just because you know they gave you they, they gave you the green light to do it like and you had no clue how to make it I mean well you didn't know all the aspects of making it but you had that vision and you know you you fulfilled it that's awesome and I think they they you know they're really clever in the way they do those grants and uh, the best part was is by accepting the grant I was required to use the structural engineers to make it to this their safety requirements mm. ended up costing us more than the grant oh my god oh no so, uh, once you once you go that far with it you can't really turn back and I think they they know like that big push really helps people. Mm. Um, really quick, uh, you mentioned that you did did like an earlier, you helped out on an earlier installation uh, at Burning Man before the Flamingo. What was like the nature of that one? Um, yeah, it was, we, we just call it the wings. It doesn't really have a very good name. Um, I built it with my friend Opal three and it's a, a small set of stairs that you walk up and it was a 25 foot wide pair of wings covered in leds wow and moving your arms around um change the leds awesome oh cool and uh sorry you said that you barely started making art kind of like in 2018 did you have any like did you try experimenting a little bit before that or that kind of was the moment that year exactly was the moment you jumped in. Yeah, Rainbow Bridge was uh, the moment I jumped in. Um, yeah, especially when it comes to uh, installation art, that was the moment. And um, kind of also answering your previous question for me, Burning Man was the first uh, festival. Um, I didn't even go to a a a real uh, big musical concert before. So for me, like going into my first Burning Man um, was in a way like life-changing as far as what art can be, how um, uh, a music musical stage can be and all of that. So, uh, and you can see that I was able to embed all that I loved uh, at Burning Man into Rainbow Bridge as much as possible. <laughs> um, but it was making sure it has uh, addressable LEDs, um, like uh, fighting for the pixel density and making sure they are both covered at two sides of the rainbow and uh, to have dedicated computers for each side so they're independent from each other. Uh, yeah. What a first festival to go to. Yeah, I think it's like something about him and his belief in what's possible, where like the first art project you do, like starting out with 25,000 LEDs is insane. It was daunting. Um, it, it, uh, the first three months while Josh is working with the engineers and getting the fabricators together, I was going to um, local um hack communities hacker communities like uh noise bridge and understanding um the choices that i need to make and i was there is a ticking time uh, i need to both design execute and deliver within the next six to eight months um and i know conceptually what led is but to take that concept and and to understand what I can buy off the shelf, what I can make with that um, has to happen in that very short period of time. And I remember experiencing stressful uh, like nights, sometimes weeks, um, trying to cram everything I can, making good choices, finding the right teammates, uh, collaborators, um, making decisions about things that I haven't yet learned whether it's what software to use, um, what kind of um, power supplies to use, how important it is weatherproofing um, when it comes to having these electronics out in the elements. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of leaps of faith, um, 
<laughs> overnight Wikipedia cramming, uh, trusting uh, people's opinion or choosing to trust uh, someone's opinion over the others. You, you, you said that you had a documentation problem back then. So, but for, for when you're doing like that kind of stuff, do you document all, you have like notebooks and stuff? Um, yeah, I, I came long ways uh, since the law firm and since the first rainbow build. And uh, now we have, um, especially for the electronics and the software team, we have uh, build diaries where we every day um, uh, we document all the issues we found, all the interesting artifacts we found, whether it's, uh, and we are encouraged to uh, go down as detailed as what panel the, um, uh, on the rainbow uh, and down to what row and what column, where was a, uh, a pixel failure, what did we do um, and all of that. And uh, it's very helpful for the next build. That's really cool. I'm really interested about like the process that goes into like each build and things like that. Also specifically like the ideation process, like where you draw inspiration from as well and like how you decide to take an idea to the next step. Um, um, uh, I love uh, like, what's up? I think it changes, it changes every single project. Mm -hmm. uh, three, sorry. Yeah, um, I I consider myself an idealist and I also love pop culture. These are the two things that kind of define my childhood and I love bringing my um, values and ideas from this uh, desire for idealism and pop culture into uh, the projects. Uh, for example, in Rainbow Bridge, um, we've done um, visuals that uh, do a nostalgic honors to Pac-Man, um, which was a big hit. Uh, we had a Neon Cat going across the rainbow uh, with the tunes. Um, at the same time, uh, one of my uh, like personal project after Rainbow Bridge, the first one was uh, building a uh, an interactive flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which to me uh, is like the um, a good symbol of a uh, fight for the separation of um, state and schools, um, freedom of spree freedom of speech. So yeah, those are, this is how I find inspiration. What about you, Josh? Um, it so it definitely changes every single project it's for me it's always like a scavenger hunt where you're kind of like looking at all these different things and trying to find two that kind of fit together in a way that makes something new and special um and then you what like start there's like a, a salesmanship that starts happening with your friend group like people who you think might be interested in it and so you you know, you, you pitch your idea and you can see on people's faces what sticks and what doesn't stick. And like, once you see something that's really sticking, other people start getting excited and then it kind of snowballs into a bigger and bigger thing. But also I'm wondering too, like in the technical sense, how does the ideation work out? Like, do you do like a lot of sketching or like does an idea almost come like fully formed because some of some of your works have like interactive touch sensors and some of them have like they it's more like the led lights or visuals and there's like so many different like sub mediums within the installation and so like which idea comes first or do they all kind of just like <laughs> happen at one time i mean uh rainbow bridge was a I guess a dream before we really thought about building it for Burning Man. And that came from, I'd say, after building uh, Phenicopterus Rex, the giant flamingo, after building that, we learned so many lessons about moving large objects and we spent all this time building the frame for it. And once we built the frame for the body, we were like, we could build another one in half the time. And then we could build a third one in a quarter of the time if we wanted to. And so we started thinking about doing like reproducible parts. 
and kind of uh, developing some efficiency in the methodology. And then from there, it, I was thinking about like, a, was it Roman keystoning? That if we built all the same sections that as long as we did it with an odd number, we'd be able to do it. And I couldn't find any other project that was done in the same way with an open, an open arch. And then you got to find like the perfect, I don't know, the perfect design for what is something you can make an arch. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do like 3D printing? I see like a 3D printer in your background. Yes. Uh, I started doing 3D printing in June last year. We were working on a pink torch project in Oakland and San Francisco. So we just, I started 3D modeling after Rainbow Bridge. So Rainbow Bridge was all, all the initial stuff was done in Photoshop and then oh, handed wow. over to the structural engineers and then came back. But it was uh, surprisingly close because if you, if you think about it, it's, it's really a two-dimensional shape. Like yeah. all the important parts are two-dimensional. So I, we learned a lot and once we, you know, liked getting to design parts and didn't like designing some other parts. We, like I started doing the 3D modeling just so I can take a little bit more control over it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's a, it's a great way to like idea and see it like in person. Um, but also my 3D printer is like always having problems and it's like you're always doing maintenance on it and trying to get the layers to stick or it's always something, but it's fun yeah. when it works. <laughs> I like, I genuinely, uh, I thought when I got this 3D printer that I was going to be using it in every single art project I'd be working on for the next six months. And then you start finding the character and the tool and you're like, oh, you'll need to babysit this thing. Yeah, especially for the first layer or something or, yeah. We do a lot of like 3D prints. Well, before COVID, we do a lot of 3D prints to the library and uh, sometimes we leave them overnight. You know, it looked like it's going good. And you get back and then you have like a spaghetti monster of filament just like everywhere. <laughs> or or warping. Agree. I don't know. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite or most challenging installation that you've worked on? Or maybe even just like a lesson that you like a big lesson you've learned from you know one of those installations? Um cone down comes to my mind. <laughs> I don't know about Josh. Uh after the success. Uh, of Rainbow Bridge. Actually, with the ongoing success of Rainbow Bridge, we came into um, this concept for Burning Man 2019 with uh, like a lot of ambitions. And we dreamt of um, just various bells and whistles that we want to add to this project, which is a 30 foot tall upside down melting ice cream cone. Um, and like to name few things, we wanted uh, a dance floor where the um, scoop dripped to be force sensitive so people can dance on it. And then the pixels that are underneath the dance floor uh, will interact with them. And then the floor is made of, uh, I believe, uh, plexiglass. Um, and uh, the whole uh, scoop and the cone, they're made of corrugated plastic and uh, initially with vacuum formed polycarbonate plastic for scoop. And uh, like we haven't used four sensors before that. We haven't vacuum formed uh, plastic before that. And uh, on top of that, we wanted a truss extending from the top of the cone for aerials to play on top of, uh, while, uh, while they're on top of the dance floor hanging from 30 feet tall. So all of these dreams totally achievable with a uh, time that's June, September, and unfortunately, we uh, experienced a series of uh, events, whether it's delays or um, not finding a vacuum former on time and, and gave us one of the hardest build experiences that we ever faced as a team. Yeah, we definitely walked out of Rainbow Bridge with, I'd say a, a little bit, of, a little too much confidence. <laughs> because, uh, after you know, after it went to Burning Man, we got to bring it to um, Art Basel, Miami, and that was a really good build. And we were so 
we're like, let's take every single thing we loved about Rainbow Bridge and then everything we, you know, fix everything we hated about it, make it, uh, Rainbow Bridge was flat on both sides. And so the design was really like very two dimensional. The LED design was very 3D. Uh, the interactivity was so much more complicated. We wanted um, we had these massive steel sections for Rainbow Bridge that every time we moved them needed a forklift. So the dream was to build the steel frame that humans could lift and move around. Um, Rainbow Bridge had to go onto a, a flat truck to transport it. And we're like, what if we built a thing that could fit into any container and any truck? And so we got really, I always say ambitious in, in the number of design features we wanted to add. Um, and when with Rainbow, we had done scene seeing and electrical design and all these things we've never done before. And it worked out. It was hard, but it worked out. And then with Cone Down, we're like, okay, now that we've learned all these things, rather than take the lesson, we want to keep going and learn more things. And so we did learn more things. So do you, when you start a new project, do you like kind of scale things back or do you still find yourself kind of inching, like taking another step forward and trying to do something more complicated or, or do you think you two found like a sweet spot? <laughs> We're still finding our sweet spot, but our tendency is to uh, take newer steps. Yeah, great. Learning is fun. Yeah, I, I, you're studying your master's at um, Cal State Long Beach. What, what kind of master's is it? I know it's a for f fine art, but uh, sculpture. Oh, sculpture. Okay, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, one of our coworkers, Courtney, her professor was uh, Brittany Ransom. I think she Ryan told me she's her professor as well. Her stuff is really cool. Yeah, and she, I, I I'm learning a lot from her class. It's. It's fun, like, um, I guess I was dabbling in the digital digital side before, like, now she's getting us to actually learn the correct way to do things. Okay. Mm. <laughs> That's I, awesome. love, I love that you guys, like, never stop learning and that, like, your philosophy is kind of never stop learning, like, keep, like, being ambitious about it. And I have so much respect about how optimistic you are about it, too, because I feel like I might have walked away from a project, like, the upside down cone like in defeat but you guys sound so like like happy that it happened like regardless of all of the like challenges that happen along the way it was hard and in our hearts it's still a success we um had a uh, event during the day where a camp at burning man that has um kids came by and we gave them ice cream um we had uh, aerialist performances. Uh, one of our campmates did, did her performance for the first time publicly. Um, we had uh, art cars with DJ that came by, parked around the cone down and did DJ sets. We had DJs that climbed up the cone and did their sets from the top. They wow. did not like carrying, it's, it's, a, it's a 30 foot tall steel rigging ladder. They didn't like carrying all their DJ gear. <laughs> but, uh, that's Next so time you, you design a pulley system, like a little elevator system for equipment. That'll be um, next. One more question mm -hmm. about Going like- Going down 2.0. Yeah. For the vacuum former that you needed, did you need like an industrial size one or something? Or was it like just a, norm, a normal, I don't, I don't know what a normal size vacuum former is, but I've seen <laughs> like DIY ones. But then I've also, at Cal State Long Beach, they actually have a vacuum former. I am going to be using that very soon. I'm very excited. That's a four by four. Okay. Um, when we first started talking about cone down, and this is you know going from the the dreaming side to the practical side, we thought about light diffusers and being able to build one mold and use the you know the the cone is the same on all eight sides. So we thought we'd be making the same light boxes over and over and over to go around it. And I genuinely dream that we'd be able to easily vacuum form four by eight sheets with like no problem. And uh, turns out that's really hard. Yeah. I think we called up maybe 20 different companies to see if we could rent their vacuum formers. 
and we'd tell people what the project was and we'd expect them to be really excited and be like, sure, come in, use the machine. And no. Oh, <laughs> so wow. we ultimately built our own and it was hard, really hard. Just bouncing off what Ryan said earlier about you know your willingness to learn, I think that's awesome. And I do think a lot of people, they do just like stop being down to learn something new. And, and it's cool that, you know, it's everything is, nothing is really a barrier. It's just like something you could learn to, you know, build, build something to get over it and, and learn how to do it. That's really cool. And that's great. I'm sure the people you work with in the foundation are like for sure inspired by just like, oh, anything's possible really if you, if you just try and put the time. I mean, it may take forever to do it, but you could definitely do it. It's not impossible. I think, uh, I think the saying is, you know, there's a, there's a bad solution. And if you've got a bad solution, you have a solution and then you work on finding a better one. Yeah, everything's, everything's a step towards progress. Cool. Um, so I think we have just like one or two more questions to ask you guys. Um, so we wanted to know like what's happening with looking up arts for the future. Like everything is not really happening right now with the current situation in the world. But I noticed on your website, you guys are still like putting out plans for the future. Um, I, I wanted to highlight Takeout Lanterns project that you guys are doing. That seems really cool and very relevant to what's going on. Um, and then other projects have 2021 like as the date next to them. So what, what's, what's happening? What's going to happen? It's three, you wanna take the, the takeout? Oh yeah, takeout, okay. Um, takeout was uh, my dream uh, early in 2020 when I was like, what, what would be a concept that captures what's happening in a um, cheerful, uplifting way. At the same time, um, like pay homage to, in, in a sense, essential workers and what's keeping them going. And um, uh, again and again, food was coming into my head and what, how restaurants and what they're doing for the society, whether it's for essential workers or people at home, they're doing this essential service that is kind of keeping us happy when everything else is not happening. And so from that, and from all the um, leftover corrugated plastic from Condon project, <laughs> um, uh, the vision just aligned to create this uh, origami inspired takeout boxes um, and turn them into lanterns of hope and find graphics that are relatable locally um, whether it's the skyline uh, of the cities uh, that like I I'm from um, or uh, have like Peace Pagoda from Japantown um, and whatnot uh, and, uh, and try to find collaborators like at restaurant level to see if they would like to host this lantern up on their, uh, by their windows. So that's how it all started. Um, and uh, it has been... It's also like one of the uh, design constraints I had in mind when thinking about it is to make sure it's COVID friendly. Uh, like one or two people uh, can do an entire lantern, whether it's via staggered schedule or meeting at one, uh, meeting in one safe location. So it, it was just a perfect um, concept for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious to see all the new installation art that comes out with these new constraints, but I mean, constraints could be, you know, useful sometimes to push boundaries in a different way. And um, as far as the foundation, um, the um, kind of things got aligned uh, towards the future well in terms of the art space. Um, we were able to increase our footprint uh, at our current workspace uh, and as like the previous tenants are moving out due to um, the decisions that they're making in turn uh, due to COVID. So uh, in other words, um, I'm actively working on um, making um, our workspace at the Looking Up Art, Art Foundation function set a bigger, more welcoming place for the community 
to come and make art once things open up. Bring wow. In, bring in some more teams. I mean, honestly, that that's the people and the space is kind of what made it all. And so right now it's all, we're trying to get it ready for when things start opening up again. But once we take over more of the space, that means there's more room for more than just our small team. We can have more than one art team going at once. And I think it'll be really fun, especially when like the skills bleed over from one team to another. Mm -hmm. um, we have one more question. We asked this to all our guests. Do you two have any memorable library experiences? Yes. <laughs> um, Rainbow Bridge was really born in a library. Like when I was on the hunt for inspiration, I ended up in the San Francisco Public Library historical stacks and going through all the old uh, photos and brochures from the Golden Gate International Exposition. And there was a sculpture of a rainbow that I found there that really kind of started us down this path of building a giant rainbow. That's an awesome library connection. Yep. Yes, I think this should be uh, a testament for our uh, patrons that they can create this in the library and then see it come into fruition and grow into, into what you guys have today. Like, that's awesome. And I think, like, all of our library patrons should do that. <laughs> yeah, there's something definitely about a library where if you don't know what you're looking for when you're looking for inspiration, that that is a special place because when you're just browsing the internet you usually get what you're looking for and if you're looking for something completely surprising yeah that's awesome how about you uh, uh a funny one comes up to my mind um in college years uh i was able to hack one of the library computers to install <laughs> a uh a korean um MMORPG game and played for extended periods of time without getting caught. That's awesome. <laughs> Shows <laughs> ingenuity at a young age. Did you install it on every computer? Uh, not only the ones. I only need to do enough to not get caught and be able to um, like play. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I knew my boundaries, uh, when to uninstall, when to, uh, avoid, like destroy the evidence and move to a different computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, both of you for joining us today for web chat Wednesdays. I had yeah, like, so much fun listening to, you know, your whole process and I appreciate you giving your time to us. And where can our library patrons find your work and learn more about looking up arts? Um, Instagram would be great. Our um, Instagram handle is uh, looking up arts. And um, we also have a website, looking up dot art and a Facebook page. Awesome. Well, we will put all the links on, on the description as well. But thank, thank you so you. much. That thank you. That's the episode of Web Chat Wednesdays. Mm -hmm.